Hi everyone, I'm Scott, and welcome to Bad Bleeps of the Bible. Our story today comes from 1 Samuel 28. Yes, I said 1 Samuel. There's actually two Samuels in the Old Testament and in the Bible in its entirety. And we're just going to dive into a little bit of Bible factopia here. If you don't know, uh, some books of the Bible come in two parts. There are First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, and in fact, the book of John at the very end of the New Testament or end of the Bible actually has three parts, First, Second, and Third John. And the really fun fact for this, the book was so long, it couldn't be contained on one scroll, so the ancient authors had to divide it into two. And that is why these books of the Bible have two parts. Also, another little fun fact about the Bible, um, and the Bible that you're probably most likely familiar with today, and the one you think of that haunts your dreams or maybe your nightmares, is ordered in what's called the Protestant method. So there are different methods for how the Bible books are put in order. The Protestant method is one, there's the Hebrew method, and there may be others. I'm not 100% sure I'd have to look it up, but I do know those are the two main, Protestant and Hebrew. And we're going to talk about the Protestant method because that's the more well-known. Again, this is specifically for the Old Testament. And what's unique about the Protestant layout is that it's not in chronological order. It's not in this is the beginning, this is the middle, this is the end. It does start out that way a little bit with Genesis, but it's actually divided into five sections. There's the law, history, poetry, the major prophets, and the minor prophets. So that's the layout in the Protestant method, which is why it's kind of all over the place in terms of a timeline in the Old Testament. So this is a lot of information. Just know that the Bible in the Old Testament, specifically the Protestant method Bible, is laid out not chronologically, but in these five sections. Truly, that was just fun facts for you. You could fast forward through it if you wanted to. Um, again, little fun facts. But let's get back to 1 Samuel 28. 1 Samuel, what could fit on the first scroll? Samuel, of whom this book is named after, was a prophet of Israel. And he had the distinct honor of anointing the first king of Israel, a dude named Saul. Which this Saul is not to be confused with the Saul turned Paul of the New Testament. Saul's for days. No, this Saul was the Old Testament Saul and the first king of Israel anointed by the prophet Samuel. And Saul was honestly a fine king of Israel for a very long time. Um, he had his bestie Samuel the prophet as a guide and help. But after Samuel died, Saul seems to have lost his way. He started talking less and less with God and because of this, the dude, Saul, lost favor with the high and mighty because obviously Yahweh must come first and you must always talk to God. And then later on in his reign, he had a literal village of God's priests murdered. And for that, it was donezo for Saul. God literally turned his back on him and Saul in response turned his back on God. They were in this bit of a, a tiff. The Bible, so deep. So when, in our story today, when the Philistine army enters the picture, these Philistines were, of course, Israel's public enemy number one, the Canaanite people. When they entered the picture and they came to seek a fight with Israel, Saul needed assistance. And this was after the death of Samuel, his guide, and when God had turned his back on him. So who could he turn to? Saul can't talk to Sky Daddy. The Bible literally says that when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him either by dreams or by prophets. So God's out. And while he typically went to his main man, Samuel, his prophet and leader, he can't because again, Samuel's dead. Or is he? Maybe Saul thought there could be a way 
to again talk to his long dead advisor. But for that, he would need magic. So he goes to the one and only person left in Israel who could perform such magic. And she is today's bleep. She's known as the Witch of Endor. And that's her name because this mysterious person has no name as we know it, no Megan, no John, nothing like that. And she's truly only known as the witch or the mistress of Endor. But her reputation as a medium and necromancer and witch is clearly known by those in the know in Israel. The fact that she's even in Israel at this time is actually fortuitous for Saul since Dude had all the magic folk removed from Israel a long time past, but the Witch of Endor was able to stay and hide herself. And here she is, the witch and Saul's only hope. So picture Saul and his two servants in the dark of the night, disguised by a cloak and hood, silently making, silently making their way to the Witch of Endor. Through enemy lines, I have to say. Remember, this Philistine army is ready to destroy Israel, and Saul is creeping through the lines to make their way to the witch. When they finally arrive at her home, maybe a cave, maybe a candy house, maybe something boring, the Bible doesn't say, but picture whatever comes to your mind when I say the home of a witch. When they finally make their way to her home, it's the deep of the night, and there's a light fog billowing. Saul, disguised, approaches the looming figure of the witch and requests a seance. A seance that will conjure up the spirit of whomever Saul requests. The witch is hesitant. She's astute. She may not know who this incognito man might be, but she will not be caught in his foolishness. And she speaks to him saying, you know what the king has done? How he has cast out all mediums and spiritists from the land? Why are you asking me to do this just to cause me to die? And Saul, again incognito, responds saying, As the Lord lives, no punishment shall come upon you for this thing. And, though still distrusting this stranger, the witch asks, Whom shall I bring up for you? And with Saul's reply, she knows instantly that it's not a stranger, but the king. The same king who kicked out her people earlier. Because he asks for the spirit of Samuel to be returned. And with this, she yells, Why have you deceived me? For you are Saul. Saul, though for his part, again promises safety for her and once again <laughs> requests the spirit of his old spiritual advisor, Samuel. And finally she agrees and begins to peer through the veil. The atmosphere darkens and the witch whispers, I see a spirit ascending out of the earth. Saul, shocked, asks, what's his form? An old man is coming up, she replies, and he is covered with a mantle. And from this description, Saul somehow instantly knows that this is Samuel. Maybe he wears a really fancy mantle. I don't know. But Saul does. The spirit of Samuel then, now corporeal, speaks, asking, Why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? And Saul answers the spirit, saying, I am deeply distressed, for the Philistines make war against me, and God has departed from me and does not answer me anymore, neither by prophets or by dreams. Therefore, I have called you that you may reveal to me what I should do. And Samuel, in all his spirit glory, replies, stating, So why do you ask me, seeing the Lord has departed from you and has become your enemy? For the Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hand because you did not obey the voice of the Lord, nor execute his fierce wrath upon them. Therefore, the Lord has done this thing to you this day. Moreover, the Lord will also deliver Israel with you into the hand of the Philistines. And tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. The Lord will also deliver the army of Israel into the hand of the Philistines. 
Samuel has just stated that not only will Saul lose the battle, he would as well lose the lives of his two sons and his own life. What I think is the creepiest line in what's stated in the text is, your sons will be with me, saying that Samuel's dead and tomorrow your sons will join him in the world of the dead. Such a creepy line coming from the spirit of Samuel. Saul is distraught and falls to the ground weeping. And slowly, as he does this, the spirit disappears into nothingness. And all that's left in the silence is Saul, his two servants, and the witch of Endor. The following day, the prophecy is fulfilled. The Israelites are defeated. Saul's sons are slain in the battle. And Saul, injured from said battle and bereft with grief and devastation because of the death of his sons, sees no hope and falls on his sword in an act of suicide. Saul is dead and his line annihilated, bringing the words of the spirit conjured by the magic of the witch of Endor to fruition. And tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. I really hope that you enjoyed today's episode. Please feel free to get in touch with me and share your thoughts at babbleepsofthebible at gmail.com and at Instagram at babbleepsofthebible. Sources for today's story can be found in our show notes, and please continue to rate, review, and subscribe. Catch you next time, and beware of witches and spirits. <laughs> Bye!